Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Cost Control for Construction Projects. This is Lecture 3A, and in this lecture, we're going to be trying to get a good understanding of the basic principles uh, used in cost control on construction projects. And we'll be talking about the application of uh, cost coding in this lecture and Lecture 3B, and trying to get a good understanding of why we want to break down things into smaller units so that we can measure our progress and see how we're doing compared to our plans. And we'll also detail a number of other factors out, including the transition from estimate to budget and the importance of those factors. Uh, really, when we think about um, budgeting for a construction project, well, we procured the project, so we probably wouldn't actively trying to um, get the project, also known as in pursuit of getting the project, then we've been successful at it if we're looking at budgeting for it, because that means we have got the contract, we have um, uh, signed off on the contract, we now have to take that estimate that we did, and now we have to start thinking about, well, how are we going to budget for the project within the framework of what the estimate was? Like, it's not like uh, we bid on this project for 10 million and all of a sudden now we can budget for 11 million. Well, you've got to take that 10 million and then you have to have factor in some contingencies we talked about in some previous lectures, like a management reserve uh, for things that we didn't know that might happen, some other contingency, contingency reserve for uh, things that we know that might happen and we're not 100% sure of because an estimate is exactly that. It's an estimate. It's our best guess at how this project, how much this project will cost, how we plan to go about it, ties to the schedule. They're very integrated as I will tell you in the upcoming courses and as I've told you in the first few lectures of this course, there is a very strong correlation between time and money. And so we want to sort of establish a methodology and a system that we can actually track the project and get a good sense of how we're doing on the project. So um, the financial aspects really around, revolve around the budget. So we need to have a pretty realistic budget. If it's not very realistic, then um, people aren't going to buy into it. Uh, it's going to be a demotivator. It's going to be problematic. If the original estimate was way off, uh, that's going to be difficult to actually succeed at because, you know, how do you how do you make a project that costs 12 million come in at 10 million? Um, so that makes it problematic right from the get go. But we definitely want to have a realistic budget for what we can do on this project. And it should also be trying to make us, you know, strive to be better and to beat the budget, right? So as I said, it all starts with the project estimate and then leads from there. And um, if we don't really do this well or we budget something, you know, from the estimate and we've held back a lot of um, the budget money um, or the actual overall project monies, then it's going to seem very, very unrealistic for the people on the project and you want to make sure that you can get the buy-in of the project team uh, that is working on the project so they have to be the information has to be somewhat transparent so that they have a good understanding of what their limitations are what their constraints are and how they have to perform to meet those constraints and in this particular course we're looking at construction cost control very much from a site perspective you know we can do cost accounting courses and we can do um, reporting structures that are more of accounting in nature but in this particular course we've taken a project management um, view of it so um, it really is very sort of leading to the hands-on aspects of running the project and controlling the budget within that project actively as you'll see in lecture 3b we'll compare and contrast between uh, the um, basically cost control and cost reporting. We'll talk about the nuanced differences there. Of course, uh, we also are, will be using a variety of different softwares as a construction company. So we do have our accounting software, which will have codings in place that can track a lot of detailed information. But we also, from a project management point of view, on uh, a site team point of view, actively work with the project schedule. And if we've cost-loaded the project schedule, we can actively 
monitor uh, how we are doing compared to our project budget and be more active in making adjustments as things occur, more close to real-time adjustments, so much more proactive in nature. So, so a little bit about cost codes. Um, without cost and labor codes, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to really track how we're doing uh, on our projects. And uh, we, we want to be able to ensure that there's codes that are attached to various items and that those items reflect um, the work that's being done. You know, I, years ago uh, when I, I was acting director at um, a college, George Brown, college and uh, I was at the time I was working with the Dean and the Dean wanted to cancel a particular program and I didn't really understand why um, she wanted to cancel that program because it seemed to me that the program was pretty viable uh, just on the surface knowing what I knew and so I wanted to see all the data that she was using to make those decisions and somebody in inputting the data had assigned full-time faculty, three extra full-time faculty to this program. And so, of course, these faculty were assigned to this program, but they weren't even teaching in this program. And so it made this program seem like it was losing a lot of money. And, of course, it also made it seem like another program was making a ton of money. This was like the wonder program uh, of the division. But it wasn't the wonder program of the division. It was just a mistake in how the faculty were assigned and the coding of those particular faculty to that program led uh, the dean to make decision, want to make a decision that really would have been um, a, a terrible mistake. So when we're doing assignments of codes and we're tracking of um, elements of the project, we have to make sure we know what we're looking at and that the costs that we're looking at are actually reflective of the work that's going on. Otherwise, the information is really not good for us. Uh, so when we're tracking, any, and this is in any kind of business, we want to make sure that we can track it to an appropriate level of detail so we understand what's going on. You know, as a division, having, having faculty assigned to the wrong program or not, it really wouldn't have a negative or plus impact at a divisional level um, to the college. But at a program level, when you're making active decisions about what to do based on profit loss, based on time, based on budget, based on schedule, that is important information. So um, the level of detail and at what level, that's why we'll talk about work breakdown structures in lecture 3A and 3B um, quite a bit because it does make a, a difference in understanding at what level, where is the problem. So we can go from a macro level like I said, in a college, you know, you go to a divisional level down to the actual program level. And so there's different, different questions, different decisions. Doesn't mean over at the division level, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's changing whether you're making money or not, but it allows us to make active decisions of what's going on in our project in very close to real time. So, you know, if we, we take some coding examples, and there's all, that's the other thing. Uh, so I'm not going to get into a specific one-only coding for this particular course, but a lot of businesses use different coding systems. Uh, some have their own coding systems. Some software programs have their own built-in coding systems. Uh, some will use the master format, which ties, of course, to the master format specifications coding systems. And we'll review that a little bit in 3B. Um, or the uniformat coding system. So there's a number of different coding systems that, that can be used. It, the important thing is whatever company you're working for and whatever coding system they're using, you're able to assign whatever the work that's being done to the appropriate coding system. So for example, um, these line items would fit under this particular code. Um, there can be a fairly substantial um, listings of um, coding systems that could be utilized. So you can see different numberings for different uh, line items for like a um, uh, HVAC subcontractor or plumbing subcontractor having standardized coding that would work for the type of work that they're doing and it would give very specific 
code items for them to be able to follow. So if I'm a plumbing subcontractor, I'd have specific coding for the work that I'm using. And then after a while, it gets very understood what code fits with what um, area of work and then what, what kind of activities that we are performing on. So that ties in um, together that way. So uh, really when we think about um, coding too, you gotta be careful, like you could have a code, a separate code for every piece of material, right? It gets um, too, I guess what I wanna say is it gets too granular and too hard to track and then people end up putting the wrong code on the wrong item. It's better to have like a list of items that fit under this code as long as it makes sense for what we wanna track. Having 10,000 codes that we use is just going to likely confuse people and it's not going to be able to be um, put into categories as easily as you might think. And then information gets put into the wrong category, like my example previous where certain faculty are assigned to the wrong program. You have to be very, very um, careful about the right level of detail. It's the same with a work breakdown structure for a construction project. Uh, and then the amount of activities that we need on a master schedule. Do I really need um, 10,000 activities for this project or could I properly and effectively manage this project with 2,500 activities? If I can effectively manage it with 2,500, then that would make a lot more sense than having 10,000 activities. It, plus, if I'm trying to estimate activity levels and detail, you know, a year out from when the work is going to be done on a project, the likelihood of it being accurate is much more diminished, much better that as we come up to the work, we're able to break it down into short term schedules and then detail that work out as long as we've encompassed the overall amount of work and the overall costs in our original estimates in our original schedules. That's what's really um, important. So getting the right level of detail, and again, I, I'll, I'll always say it kind of depends on the type of project and what we're doing. I guess my point too is with this little example that I, I did up on Microsoft Project is, you know, am I, am I good if this is this Dempsey Medical Building and we're doing a renovation and we're installing the copper fit, piping and fittings and we've got 40 days and we've assigned the plumbing uh, uh, three plumbers to this work, right? Uh, for the all 40 days, and we're going to be installing 8,000 linear feet of pipe, and we put a cost to that piping per foot, and we put a um, costing to our plumbers per hour. Am I comfortable that that's the good appropriate level of detail to manage this whole project um, on the plumbing portion of it? I'm going to say no because I won't be able to dig down and see how it's going. Like where, you know, when we actually track the project, so this is fine, this would be for our baseline plan, let's say at the highest level, and this is, if this is all we've got, that's a pretty long time to try to track how they're doing. So if we want our information to be closer to real time, you know, 10 days might be better to um, break that down into, and an area of work might be better. So if we've allocated in this example for the basement 10 days, first floor 10 days, second floor 10 days, third floor 10 days. So for ease of, um, ease of this example, let's say there's approximately the same linear footage of piping on each floor. Uh, then I'm just saying in this example, I could have easily had 12 days here, 10 days, eight days, whatever it is, right? But let's say it's fairly equal, so we've broken that down, so our costing is broken down fairly equally. And again, this doesn't have to be equal, as long as it reflects what work is being done on each floor. Um, so if one floor was 20,000, another floor was 30,000, that's fine too. But we've got it broken down at that floor level. We would still have at the highest level that total amount, 100,800. But if let's say when we're tracking it, our actual costs were 110,000. Well, I'd want to know where the other 9,200, where we're losing it. Are we losing it equally on one each floor? Or did it all get lost on the basement? Why? And then I want to dig down into the basement and find out what's going on. So it's better to break it down. Plus, I would be better to find out in the basement that we have uh, been short 
or sorry, that we're, are, we're over budget by $9,200 on the basement. Well, I would know that as that work is starting to go on. Here, I'm just going to find out kind of later on that we're losing money. So this level of detail is not a good level of detail for this particular project. This is a much better level of detail. Now, do I need to know the, the linear footage and um, install timing for each room? I, in this particular case, I'm going to say no, but maybe in some cases I do want a little bit more detail than that, right? So then I could break that down further and further detail. So, but what is the, the best breakdown will attach to the activities that we need to manage at the lowest level. So that goes back to what I was saying. Do I need 10,000 activities or do I need 2,500 activities to effectively manage my costs and be able to track it as the project is being constructed so that we can be very active in controlling our costs and controlling our schedule. So it's kind of getting that mindset in uh, place. In lean construction methodology, it's all about uh, reducing waste and adding value to the client. Well, we add value to the client when we do the work to the expectation that they uh, have for the project and we don't waste a lot of time and money and quality line issues during the process. So this helps to pull everything together that way. So as if we're going to answer that question, we definitely prefer this over that, right? And this here, I've just put in some cost codes and I just put in a work breakdown structure hierarchy, which you can do in a scheduling software um, easy enough. And any codes that you would want to put could tie and attach back to your accounting software um, codes that we were looking at back um, here, right? So they could tie in that way if it makes sense for you that way. You can also, of course, uh, filter and adjust um, your screens in a scheduling software to suit uh, the cost codes that you want to bring up. So if you just wanted to review and filter, for example, um, cost codes with 400, you could do a quick review that way. Um, most scheduling software or any kind of software uh, allows you to do those kind of things. So um, definitely uh, that sorting aspect and being able to um, review things in more detail can be quite helpful. I think I've got a few examples of just a schedule uh, estimating software um, pulling down and breaking information into more details. It's not in this specific example that I had scheduling, but it gives the same kind of um, breakdown for a plumbing um, example where you might want to get further detail and you want might want to filter the information to a, a certain level of detail. Because of course you might have just line items in an estimate, but you might want to find out, well, what is coming from this basement floor, how much do we have in material estimated for each floor, because now it's attached to an area of work, and how many hours of labor, if we're thinking about productivity rates and monitoring productivity rates, then how many labor hours have we factored in for each floor? And of course, if we know that, then we get a good sense of uh, when we're tracking it, how we're doing compared to the plan, if especially like a uh, plumbing subcontractor or any subcontractor where they're self-performing the work, you have to very carefully monitor your productivity rates to ensure that you're going to meet your overall uh, estimates and budgets for the project. So um, that can be broken down um, that way. And you also get a, a sense of, uh, from a point of view of uh, percentage of the work in particular um, line items that's being done. Um, how does this line up with the percentage of work? So there's the ones that are a high percentage and there was the ones that are very low percentage. And then how are they playing out in real time as the project is um, being um, constructed? So we have uh, our, the cost control system. Uh, when we think about a cost control system, there's different levels and different uh, points that we need to consider. You know, what are, what are we including, obviously? So that's going to include everything that's involved in the project. And so then that's going to include uh, everything that we're contracted to do, which would be the project scope. And we break that down further. That would, at the lowest level, those would be the work packages. At the activity level, that we're assigning somebody to do something. And then there's a cost associated with that work. 
Uh, so for every line item, there is then a cost association. And that allows us to track and monitor that information. And again, what's the right level that we can effectively monitor that and give us a mo enough detail without making it overly onerous for the people running the project. So what, have, what, is, what is our budget and what are the breakdowns of cost to our work packages that we are working on? So what accounts are we going to be monitoring? What's going to be involved in this overall project? Uh, so for example, we, you know, if we have a certain trade and they're not involved in this project, well, that's not part of this particular system for this project. A status report, well, that a status report describes um, how the project is doing at a moment in time. So what's the status as of um, this date? And so, for example, uh, you've accomplished 50% of the work, spent 55% of the project funds, and are 20 months into a 36-month um, project. So that's giving you a status update so that somebody can very quickly at a high level tell uh, how this project is doing. Now, a progress report identifies the activities, the individual activities that have taken place since the last progress report. Um, so usually uh, very frequently of maybe monthly, sometimes it's bi-weekly, uh, so that you can have a good handle on the progress that is being made. And you should have a good idea of exactly what activities are finished or percent complete. So, you know, this particular activity um, for example, uh, foundation uh, walls are 75% complete, right? So if you have X amount of foundation walls measured, say, cubic meters of concrete that's been poured, you, and you had, say, um, 100, 100 cubic meters, you've got 75 cubic meters done, as an example. So that would be giving you um, the progress and the costs that have been incurred in doing that. And of course, uh, if we've uh, achieved any particular milestones, that would be brought up too in the progress report. Now, if we have some of that information, we have some good understanding of productivity uh, that's being placed on the project, productivity rates, then we can more accurately project outward or forecast how this project will proceed. If we get into full earned value analysis, you can definitely see trends that are forming in certain elements of the work, which allows you to say, well, today we are ten, we are a hundred thousand dollars over budget, and we're twenty days behind schedule. If this trend continues, we will be three hundred and fifty thousand dollars over budget, and we will be thirty-two days um, behind schedule. So that's just giving you an illustration of a forecast. And the idea would be, of course, with that, if you trend that out, then you want to be looking at well, how do we stop that from becoming reality? Uh, so that's giving us really impactful information that we can then act on today as opposed to, oh, well, we're going to be X amount over, we're going to be late and not do anything about it. Project management is all about iterations. It's not about having the perfect plan in the beginning and everything just goes to the perfect plan. It's about iterations. We get a little bit off track, we pull ourselves back. We get a little bit off track, we pull ourselves back. It's like a plane fly flying autopilot from uh, Toronto to Los Angeles, and it's on autopilot. Well, it's constantly retracking itself. It's constantly being taken off course, slight iterations that then retrack itself on its path. Um, so if we didn't do that, we just continue and we would have that um, over budget and over time um, issue that we'd have to deal with. So I just want to bring up Stein's Law. I think I brought it up uh, very quickly in a previous uh, video, but Stein's Law says that a trend will continue until it stops. I think it's uh, a, great, a great one for its simplicity, all right? A trend will continue until it stops. Next time you hear uh, Wolf Blitzer in the Situation Room saying this is going to happen and this is going this direction and this is, doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's a trend, and if we do nothing, or if things just continuing the way they are, yeah, it will happen. Uh, but there's a lot of things that can happen in the interim um, before that occurs, right? So um, a trend will continue until it stops. If you're an effective project manager, you're an effective site uh, superintendent, you work very, very actively um, to 
stem and stop negative trends and proactively work with positive trends. So that's really a, a way of thinking that how you approach projects uh, really will help you in your future. So components of a um, cost control system, uh, strong job cost and equipment tracking. Um, cost, you need to keep them up to date. So you have to actively manage it, otherwise it's kind of useless. Uh, it should, what this really means is when you develop a cost control system, it shouldn't be something that is taking all of your time, that is um, complete drudgery, that people feel is useless. You should be looking at the value in it. And if it's not, then it's not a great system. And the system needs to be tweaked, improved, or redone. Cost control system should work to your benefit, not to your detriment. So if we're trying to um, track the, the cost of uh, pencil erasers or something, we're probably going too much into the weeds uh, in detail. And if it's taking us an onerous or, or an exceptional amount of time, um, that can be somewhat problematic. On the other hand, if it's detailed enough that it's ensuring that we know what's going on, and if there's there could be construction fraud going on and stuff like that, if it highlights that, that we can dig deeper, um, then that's okay. Uh, but it shouldn't be so onerous that it, it is um, that much of a problem. I had a while back on a particular uh, consulting project that I was doing where um, the client, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, I made a mistake and it was on um, the HST tax that we had and I must have spent uh, two hours going back and forth with the accounting department uh, of the particular company. So between us, they spent two, more than two hours, I spent at least two hours and the difference was about $6.50. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like. It should be on amounts that are reflective of something that um, is um, substantial enough that it makes it worth your time and effort to be able to track, monitor, and control. So, uh, and um, uh, is it is a system that processes, and I think I've got a typo there, but basically is a system that um, has processes and uh, procedures that allow it to be part of a system. So you're systemizing your processes and procedures so it's easy, it's controllable, everybody knows what they need to do and it's not ad hoc chaotic. Easy to access the data. This is where a lot of the productivity tools uh, that are being utilized today such as um, uh, Bluebeam, uh, PlanGrid, uh, Fieldwire, uh, I'll forget one I'm sure, but uh, they're, they're all good productivity tools that also makes it easier to um, gather data from that perspective. And of course, if we are monitoring costs on a project, we can also track um, outflows of cash. And so if we've got our schedule, actually this is where monitoring a schedule with costs can be very helpful because we can actually track the outflows of money. We can also pre forecast the outflows of money long before the project starts. And then that way we can ensure our schedule of values and our inflows of uh, capital matches the outflow. And then where we have a um, difference, we can ensure we have proper lines of credit, liquidity in the business to be able to cover off any differences that way. So um, cost control also means the monitoring of inflows and outflows of uh, money, better known as cash flow. So, um, as I mentioned, it starts with the uh, preparation of a cost estimate and the construction budget. So you got the estimate that got you the project, transfers over to the uh, budget areas. And very often, smaller contractors might use um, unit costs such as uh, volume measurements or area measurements. Uh, you'll find that mid to larger size uh, contractors uh, tend to like to use productivity rates because you get a really good sense per hour of what's being produced. Uh, so you can really get a good sense and you can track that when you're self-performing the work that works really well uh, to track the um, hours of work compared to the output 
right? So if you are uh, producing uh, so many, uh, so much uh, square footage of form work uh, per hour, then you can really sort of track that with your project team, right? And that can be much more active in the sense of monitoring um, the work. So productivity rates is a good way when you're self-performing the work. When you're not, it might make a lot of sense to do it by, you know, what is uh, being produced, right? What's the end result being produced? Because you've got cost and subcontract agreements for lump sums in those cases. Or a combination if you self-perform and you have uh, work that is being sent, sent out, like so it's, it's subcontracted. So co control uh, codes, uh, we definitely want to have a good purchase order system. And we did talk about, you know, do we do a cent decentralized or a centralized purchasing department? But we definitely want to have a good PO uh, system so that we have a good understanding of for which projects these materials are being utilized. And then if we can attach codes to what was ordered to the work that's being done, then we can attach materials um, to the budget right so we've got a budget and then we can see actuals and we can compare budget was this much actual was this much and we have we're pretty close to or we're over or we're under so it gives you a good sense um, that way um, from that perspective as our, as i mentioned you know there's different formats that can be used for cost accounts and cost coding uh, master formats a, a popular one but um, there are a lot of different ones so don't expect uh, for whatever company you end up working for, um, that it's a particular universal cost code. But um, if it, if there is one that's probably why most widely used, it'd be master format and unit format um, type cost codes. So really, too, when we're managing the process and looking at how things are being uh, evolving, the work that's actually being done, we should start out with a really good breakdown structure of the project so that we have categories of work and then we can look within those categories so as i said earlier you got the high level like in a college you know the division you got the overall college how does the college do financially from uh, uh as a college right you got different divisions within the college maybe you've got technology maybe you've got business maybe you've got health sciences and so then you could check how each one of those does over a year from an accounting perspective. But then now you got down at the program level. Well, how does each program do? So that's really now breaking it down by program. You can see which programs make money and lose money. And that helps you make business decisions as to which programs are viable and which ones aren't. Well, the same thing in a construction project. At the highest level, we got the project. Then we've got our work breakdown structure that'll take us down into the different levels. And then we can see where, we're, where we did well with our estimate, where we did well with our breakdown to the budget and what the actuals are. Are we under budget or are we over budget? And then we ask the questions, why? And that'll be getting further into the course uh, when we start looking at delays and cost impacts and relief and change orders and all those other fun things with uh, cost control. So that's what I wanted to cover in today's lecture. And uh, hopefully that's uh, sort of getting a little bit of sense uh, crystallized, but we'll be getting into much more deeper uh, topics as we go along. So this is Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day. And we'll see you next time in lecture 3B, where we'll jump into work breakdown structures in more detail. Bye for now.